welcome everybody. Um, I didn't realize I was reading the privacy statement. Please realize that you're being recorded. So hopefully you all click to continue. Uh, we're gonna start off with a land acknowledgement. Uh, we would like to recognize that we are webcasting from and to many different parts of Alberta today. The province of Alberta is located on Treaty 6, Treaty 7 and Treaty 8 territory and is a traditional meeting ground and home for many indigenous peoples. So again, good morning. Uh, I'm Dr. Jordan LaRue, and I am the physician lead representative for the Central Zone. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all this morning to our 2021 PCN Strategic Forum. Like everything else this year, our forum looks a little bit different. For many months actually prior to when our lives changed, we were already busy planning a forum for May 21. It was building upon last year's forum, both upon the theme of scaling and spreading, uh, the promising transformational practices, as well as bringing even more key individuals together to talk about best practices and the journey ahead. It was going to be epic. There was going to be a big room where all of us would gather, drink mediocre coffee, grab goodies at a buffet table, meet new faces and catch up with those we've met before, shaking hands or embracing in a warm hug. Though the thought of uh, physical contact now gives me a certain, anyway. <laughs> We're kind of trained that way now. Uh, we would hear from system leaders about our accomplishments and what the next few months would bring to our PCN world. Then we were to gather in small rooms, listen, discuss, and unscramble the complexities of our health system. The forum to the delight of some, and as always, the disappointment of others, we know who you are, uh, would have had a theme to focus us, to tie the event together and allow us to have some fun. But here we are. Uh, over a year into a world that only a few of us could have envisioned. Today, we are not able to enjoy the handshakes or a midday fruit kebab break. There is no theme, so there will be no Tickle Me Elmo, Snuggies, or Spanx this year. I didn't get the memo about the Spanx, so that may not be entirely true. Uh, we are so happy to still be able to come together, albeit in a different way. We are virtual, uh, which means we have the opportunity to have people join us who may not have otherwise been able to travel to this event. So silver lining. We have made the event much shorter, uh, just two hours. We recognize that so many of us are zoomed out and we know that everyone is extra, extra busy. In spite of a tremendously difficult year for all of us, what is not different is that we have a lot to celebrate in our various roles in our roles as individuals, in our roles as physicians and team members, and as the profession of medicine, caring for our patients and caring for each other. And of course, as system leaders from Alberta Health, Alberta Health Services and primary care networks, all partnering to support the system throughout this pandemic this past year. Through the difficulties we've had in these roles, we had set goals for ourselves before the pandemic. So yeah, even through a raging pandemic, we have still managed to achieve both goals and make progress on many priority areas. So today we are gonna pause and we're gonna look at the progress that we've made. So who's here today? As always with our forums, we are pleased to have our PCN board and committee chairs and members, our PCN executive directors and other senior PCN staff. We have our partners from Alberta Health, Alberta Health Services and the AMA uh, Medical Association uh, ACT team. Uh, we also have representatives from the section of family medicine and section of rural medicine. So and what are we going to do today? Uh, after our opening remarks, we are going to have a quick rundown of our key provincial initiatives. We will take a brief break, a uh, bio break, to allow for a coffee refill and or wine because it's five o'clock somewhere. Uh, then we will come back together for breakout conversations. Uh, lastly, we will close before the physician in-camera session begins, which I think is going to be about uh, 10.30. Breaking at 10 and the in-camera at 10.30. So before I pass the microphone over, I just want to earnestly thank each and every one of you for your contributions this last year. Uh, we've seen everybody step up uh, and going above and beyond and trying to balance the additional complexities while still doing what was already a very difficult uh, rewarding, demanding job, as in, you know, what we do in healthcare. So the pandemic still rages on. We're in the third wave. But I just want to remind everyone that I see the light is at the end of the tunnel for us to emerge from this and return to at least a little bit of normalcy. 
So again, thank you so much. Now I'm gonna hand the microphone over to Dr. Justine Balco, uh, who will talk with us about our environment since the last PCN forum. Thank you. Thanks, Jordan. Now, am I actually Justine? Yes. Okay, perfect. I thought that was something new. Um, so I've realized that I much prefer leaning on a podium and doing this. Sitting in front of a computer is a little bit more daunting. It's, it's interesting. Uh, anyways, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks very much. I'm going to uh, set the stage and, and uh, introduce some of the the elements that we've, uh, you know, seen success on through the course of the past year, uh, as well as uh, touch on some of the initiatives that we've been working on, and and just give us our, ourselves an opportunity to to celebrate uh, how far we've come in a very challenging year, which we always seem to uh, surprise ourselves and impress each other. I think we're doing a fantastic job. Uh, it's interesting, actually. Uh, I have a lot of notes beside me. Uh, it's it's I'm kind of overwhelmed at how much stuff we've actually done here in the last little while. So as you've heard, you know, the last time we were all together was February of 2020. Uh, certainly feels like a lifetime ago, given the last, uh, you know, several months of all of our lives. And at that point, we were in downtown Calgary, um, rubbing shoulders with one another, you know, enjoying mediocre coffee, as Dr. LaRue had said. I thought it was quite good, actually. Um, and we had the theme of scaling up. And when I was on stage doing opening remarks, it was, the talk was aptly titled Today and Tomorrow. Oh, what little we knew at that point. And I believe at that point, at that forum, um, uh, the five second rule actually held. So if something fell on the floor, you could still eat it within five seconds. I think nowadays, if it happens, it owns, it's owned by the floor. <clears throat> In any case, um, looking back at that forum, you know, I'm, I'm looking at some of the things we had already accomplished and what was underway, uh, pretty un unreal. The, the provincial task groups and our PCN, and gov um, PCN governance and, and um, leadership structures were in place both zonally and provincially. Um, Alberta Health Services had recently just launched wave one of their Connect Care initiative. Um, the zones had all recently submitted their service plans. And let me see what else we had done here. And we also had discussed uh, the report of recommendations to Alberta Health Services um, from Alberta Health. So a lot of things going on. And amidst all of that stuff, there was one slide, one slide entitled coronavirus, and it was, basically telling us that Alberta Health Services and Alberta Health were closely monitoring the situation. And five weeks later, <clears throat> things happened. And I think it changed uh, the trajectory of the world. Well, it certainly changed the trajectory of the world for all of us. Um, and certainly in no small part, the, the initiatives and the work that all of us were working so hard on at that time. And you know, we had a long list of activities and initiatives that was to define the year ahead. And I think those did change. <clears throat> you know, some had to be paused. Some continue to move forward, albeit more slowly. Some were new and we've done a fantastic job. I think all of us as partners can really be proud of where we've come. Um, and then some of them, uh, you know, just kind of uh, slowed down a little bit, but we still move towards an end goal just with a little bit of a delay there. So having said that, you know, we all know the amount of work that's gone on this past year. And I think we need to be very proud. I've said that about five times, but it's, it really is overwhelming to know with all of the uh, you know, pressures that we've dealt with personally, professionally, the unknowns, the extra work, uh, the fact that we are where we are and, and still smiling and still providing care to patients in Albertans the way we are is, is phenomenal. And today's about showcasing that success. So with that, I'm gonna get into the next slide maybe if I could, thank you. <clears throat> I just wanna restate what uh, you know, the PCN physician leads are committed to. We spent a lot of time a couple of years ago trying to, to define what we were trying, what we wanted to do as your physician leads exec. And you've all seen this statement before, PCN leads help create the conditions for members to transform to a fully integrated patient's medical home, providing value for patients and providers. And two critical components that we focus on are continuity, and that's through CII CPAR, paneling, access. I think there's uh, no debate as to the importance of that to create that strong patient's medical home and, and deliver the, the care we want to deliver. And then the other critical piece of that is economic enablers. And that is through PCN funding, grant funding, and enabling and supporting uh, you know, the section of family medicine and different compensation models, leveraging in-kind resources, finding any which way we can 
to use the resources we have to drive the best care we, we, we can. Next slide, please, Crystal. So continuity, like I said, this is a foundational element to the patient's medical home. There's no surprise there. Um, you know, we, we, we all know the mountains of evidence that link high quality care and outcomes to strong patient provider continuity. Next slide. And now I'm gonna move into a little bit of a talk about priorities. And this one's interesting because there are a lot of priorities and I'll touch on some of them as we get into this talk and, and some of my colleagues will, will uh, uh, expand on a few of our topics. And like I said, th these are shared priorities. We we're in partnership. And I think this is what's so cool about where we're at today. There's, there's priorities that are certainly born of PCNs and, and PCN leads exec, but there's also priorities from our partners, Alberta Health and Alberta Health Services. And what's, what's so great is their shared priorities. They may not be on top of list for you know, everyone in the room, each priority, but they are certainly on the list and they are all integral to getting where we need to go. And the fact that we're not islands unto ourselves and we're working together in any which way we can, uh, you know, shows the faith we have in one another and the fact that we do want a partnership. Yeah, all of us are used to, uh, you know, working in a system where you're, you're sort of isolated and, and hoping things come together as best they can. And here we are setting the stage to make sure that we've come together and we're doing it right and co-designing uh, from the outset. So with that, I think we can move into the next slide, Crystal. So here's some of the, the big ticket priorities that we're talking about. And as I said, some will be very familiar to you and, and some might not be so familiar. Uh, and that's what we hope to, to touch on. And I think you'll very quickly see that there's very significant overlap in what we all do and what we all want and, and real opportunities for, for doing things better for patients and providers. And like I said, if there's any questions, um, please pop them in the chat and then we'll uh, endeavor to address them. And also in your meeting package, there, there is a fair amount of information on each of these uh, priorities and initiatives uh, for you to further educate yourself if there's any additional questions that we don't touch on here. So I think with that, I'm gonna start with CII CPAR. That was really cool, wow. So what's CII CPAR? It's a technical enabler for continuity, for relational and informational continuity, and obviously a building block for management continuity. So for those of you that have ventured into this world, uh, you probably know full well a lot of the benefits that we're seeing. Uh, mo I think most people have started hearing about this from the successes we're starting to see with uh, rollout, um, but it does a number of things. One, it, it declares who our patients are and who we're connected to in the system. So for those of us uh, that are connected to this, net care and the quote unquote system uh, is able to reflect the fact that this is my patient and for the patient, this is my provider. And you can imagine that the benefits that holds in terms of uh, you know, that, again, that continuity as a, a patient moves through their journey in the healthcare system. Coming in the next few weeks, there's actually gonna be a primary care provider display built within net care actually. Um, you know, what this does too, is it does emphasize to patients the importance of the continuity because we do get um, uh, notifications and, and basically it lets the provider know when our patient has entered into the system through day surgery, through the emergency, through hospital admissions. And for those patients to come in and realize that we already are aware of, of where, they're, where they've been in their journey and we are part of that, I think it's very powerful for them. So next slide. And so here we are with some of the implementation rollout. Um, as you can see, we're starting to move the needle. Um, the North Zone is doing fantastic if you look at their numbers compared to totals. And every, but at the end of the day, everybody is moving in the right direction. I notice Calgary's numbers are higher, but I notice their gray bar is longer. So I don't know if I can celebrate that and Ernst and I can poke fun at one another because um, we do like to have our, you know, our, our healthy competitions as we move through. Uh, so, so time will tell to see who wins that cup. Anyhow, um, as you can see, for us, uh, you know, showing this, you know, every few months, you see the numbers moving forward, which is fantastic. I'm getting a message here too, so I'm making sure I'm not getting scolded. No, I'm doing well. This is one of the first times that I think I'm a little bit ahead of schedule. Usually I have somebody waving at me to uh, move things along, so, so I'm actually quite proud of myself. We can move into the next slide though. Now this is really cool. Um, so I think a lot of you have seen the uh, Rogers diffusion of innovation curves. 
this is, uh, you know, what we use and, and what is kind of used worldwide to assess innovation. Uh, we, we've expanded on it before. And it, it kind of looks at that, uh, that um, uh, you know, adoption through time, if you will, uh, where, you know, we start with those early innovators to the early adopters and moving through. And basically there's some significant points here that we, we pay a lot of attention to. You see the red one is the valley of death and the blue one is the tipping point. And the tipping point is basically um, the point at which there's mass uptake of said innovation. And that's when you know the ball starts really rolling in the right direction and the inertia is behind it. Uh, the one that, we, that, that most organizations um, really kind of pay attention to and are concerned with is that valley of death. And that's the one that if you can't make it past there, most innovations die. And I think I'm very, I can speak for everyone here that we're very proud to say that we have passed the valley of death with our adoption of CII CPAR. So we're headed in the right direction. We've moved past the most significant point of concern. So there's no reason why we can't see the success that we need to see. And again, I'm gonna you know, add that this is in light of a global pandemic and many other changes uh, that have uh, kind of been underway in the last little while. So the fact that we can keep these things moving along is a credit to everyone in this, on this forum and beyond. Uh, you know, the commitment to, to keeping uh, improvements going, uh, you know, as we work through some significant stressors in the system is, is again, just remarkable. We can move on to the next slide. So e-notifications, this is what I was talking about within CII CPAR. And this is, you know, again, getting into that integration technology and some of the things it can do. And as I said, e-notifications are built into our EMRs. So when our patients have connection to the system, be it, as I said, day surgery, emergency, hospital admissions, the notifications are sent to those providers that are alive on CII CPAR. So basically, it's an opportunity to know in a very timely fashion, almost a real, real time fashion, where, patient, where our patients are as they move through the system and go through their healthcare journeys. Um, I don't think I need to explain to any of the providers or anybody in this room the, the potentials for this and, and the power that, uh, that this can provide. And so what you're seeing here is the number of actual e-notifications, and it's broken down by zone uh, based on color. And going and looking at March and April of uh, this past year, we're looking at 16,000 notifications sent out. So that's basically, you know, 16,000 potential opportunities for smoother transitions. For patients being discharged from hospital, it gives us the opportunity to reach out and, and you know, get a little bit more information as to where they're at. For patients being admitted, it's the opportunity to be aware that they're, that they're admitted, frankly, and, you know, to prepare for what we might need to do with regards to their families and, and support thereafter and so on and so forth. So it really has... Um, you know, opened a new door for the continuity that just wasn't there before. And I think most of my colleagues that, uh, that uh, have gone live with this have seen uh, a lot of benefit to using it. And as I said, patients are often very impressed to know that when they come to see us in the office, we already know where they've been and we're already prepared to, uh, you know, in a much more efficient and timely way, provide the care that they need at that time. And I was going to say that for average um, e-notifications uh, for a provider thus far, it's, it's on average about two per day for a panel of about a thousand patients. So it's not absolutely overwhelming, but uh, there's, certainly an, you know, there, there's certainly a number going out that uh, we have those opportunities to help our, our patients. Sorry, I'm just checking my notes again. We're good. Okay, moving on. The next one is home to hospital to home. And I think it's a fitting transition from the CII CPAR talk to move into this. And this is again, a really good example of, you know, the, the shared priorities and shared initiatives that really potentially make it better for our patients. Um, I'm gonna give a, a relatively high level uh, explanation as to what this initiative is. And I'm well aware that there's people on this forum that could probably do a much, much better job of getting into the details as it's been a mountain of work to, to put this together and the amount of commitment to, to move this forward has been quite, uh, quite overwhelming. So H2H2H, as we love to uh, refer to it, is a transition guideline basically and a set of guidelines to help the patient move through their journey. 
pretty simple, from their homes to their hospital, back to home. And it's, it's really a co-design and uh, you know, a mechanism of working together to figure out how we can do it better including patients, including um, administration, including specialty care and primary care, which is critical to this piece. And that guideline, as I said, a mountain of work, um, an incredible piece of work was ultimately approved by the Pro Provincial PCN Committee and AHS Clinical Operations Executive Committee uh, just this past year. And to that end, each zone has started a task group to implement the six guideline elements <clears throat> and we're, and beyond that working on implementation plans. And I think with the next slide, we'll be able to sort of clarify what those elements are. So there you go, these are the pieces. Um, for those of you not intimately involved in this work, uh, I don't think it's any surprise that you can see the critical parts that, uh, or the critical um, elements that uh, primary care plays and PCNs play throughout uh, these pieces. So, you know, confirmation of the primary care provider and admit notification, well, that's where I said a nice segue from CII CPAR. Uh, that will declare to the system who that care provider is um, at time of presentation. Admit notification, well, that's exactly a part of what CII CPAR does. Um, but through all of this, and this is where, you know, we function on the, I'm just jumping back here. My computer is doing something, but it's quite all right. Um, you know, looking at some of the other elements here, I mean, transition planning, referral and access to community supports, the care plan, this only works if it's co-designed. And this only works if we are aware of, uh, you know, the abilities uh, of one another, um, kind of the strengths we've been to bring to the table, the pinch points. And that's what we've been doing is putting it together so it's the, the most um, well-informed set of guidelines and system that hopefully it will work well for patients and providers and make it a much better experience for all of us. And it really will wrap that patient's medical home around the patient throughout their journey. And with that, you know, I'm gonna touch on a really cool example of this from, from one of our PCNs in the province. And it's touching on that follow-up to primary care. And I'm going to shine a light on Edmonton South Side right now, their, their Transitions of Care um, initiative. So basically, you can read for yourself, but you know, all clinics staffed with a primary care nurse, which is about 70%, have adopted these, these, uh, these processes, these somewhat standardized processes. So looking at that six-month time period, July to December of 20, there are nearly 7,000 hospital discharges. And these, the nurses were actually risk stratifying these patients to, uh, to determine when to receive a primary care follow-up with the target of being less than or equal to seven days. So almost 80% with that initiative in place, 80% of 7,000 hospital discharges in a short period of time had a primary care follow-up within that time frame. And if we look at some of the metrics comparing to national averages, et cetera, the ED revisits in 30 days, 10% versus almost 20 to 25%, that is phenomenal. And then the 30-day hospital readmission, if we look at the Edmonton zone compared to the Edmonton South, again, that's a pretty profound, uh, you know, improvement and uh, kind of enhancement of the care these patients are providing and, and reduced burdens to the system. You know, now that CII CPAR is moving forward, these processes can be adjusted and tweaked and, you know, there's potential for even more success. And again, I, I don't dare to get into the details when uh, I know there are people that have been working on this and, and, and making it such a, a powerful system. And I'm sure many of you will want to reach out to your colleagues at Southside to, to get a better sense of how they've done this and, and seen such great success. But but really credit to the Southside PCN and what they've done there. And I'm sure there's initiatives like this all over the province. So next slide there, I think, Crystal. And then we're moving into the Alberta Surgical Initiative. This is a big one. And pop onto the next slide. <clears throat> so again, uh, you know, you can read for yourselves. ASI is a plan to ensure that by 2023, all Albertans receive scheduled surgeries within clinical, clinically appropriate timelines. The point of this, you know, will shape the demand for surgery, manage the capacity to deliver surgery, improve the patient journey from towards recovery from the surgery, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I think, you know, there's all of these moving parts behind this, and I really want to emphasize that improve the patient journey because uh, we've all been very intimately involved in this, and that has been a focus, the patient. It's uh, for all of us, for our colleagues at Alberta Health, Alberta Health Services primary care providers, PCNs, 
we've really wanted to make sure that this makes it better for everyone. Crystal, you can maybe move forward. So the ASI has many projects underway. As I said, when this is a big one, this is a big one. Um, this is starting with three surgical initiative or three surgical services, urology, orthopedics, and ophthalmology as a start, as a, a way to look at how can we make this better from the time before a patient needs to enter the acute care system, during and after. And what's really, uh, what's really cool to see uh, from somebody on the primary care side is that the entire process is wrapped by the patient's medical home. So there is not, it is in all of the, you know, uh, ways we use to describe this and, and kind of uh, highlight it in, in a picture form, the medical home wraps around the patient. So it is not a abandonment of the patient from their medical home and their primary care provider um, when they enter into the acute care system. The point is to stay linked throughout and have better partnerships with our specialist colleagues to make sure that the transitions and the care is smoother, more efficient, more effective. So to that end, much like we talked about with home to hospital to home, this doesn't work without appropriate co-design. Um, and I can say there's been a pretty solid commitment to co-design from the get-go. It's, it's meant a lot of work for all of us. Um, and I thank you for, for that. But for all of these pieces, you know, specialty advice, the electronic closed loop referrals, the care pathways, if it's done in isolation by one group or the other, it does not work. So we've been spending a lot of time to forge the right partnerships, create the right relationships, and you know, move things forward in the right direction. And it's slow. It didn't help, again, that we had a global pandemic that uh, took people's attention away. But it, it's, I, I say it's slow, but it's, it's moving in a direction and it's moving in the right direction. Um, we're having an opportunity here to really, to really kind of change the way we do things and, and create models that would be certainly easily applied across many other specialties. And I think that's the intent. And again, if there's additional questions and whatnot that we can follow up on uh, after this forum, I'm happy to talk about it and I'm sure many others will as well. And now with that, I think next slide, we can move into our next initiative, which I'll be handing off to Dr. Baylor, virtual care. Thanks, Justin. So I'm um, just gonna spend a few minutes talking to you about what's happening in the virtual care space in Alberta. Um, of course, virtual care is a pretty significant enabler of patients' medical home, and uh, we've had rapid scaling of virtual care across uh, Canada in the past year. So although desire and advocacy around how virtual care could be used as a tool to uh, en enable the patient's medical home is not new, the scaling of virtual care is quite new. And the codes that were put in place in Alberta were done so in obviously a very uh, quick fashion in order to allow patients to be seen virtually and maintain safety around the pandemic. Um, but the physician leads executive and the AMA are acutely aware that the codes as they stand right now uh, really don't set up practices for sustainability in delivering virtual care in the long term. So AMA has been working on a couple fronts to try and address this. Uh, one is to try and in a very urgent fashion, um, you know, advocate for changes in the codes that would allow for immediate sustainability to primary care and community-based specialty practices. The second is really around the AMA virtual care strategy, which sets out the longer term vision of where we think virtual care could go in the next number of years. Um, this is a draft strategy. Obviously, there's a lot of interest in it becoming a joint strategy with Alberta Health and Alberta Health Services. And uh, we're looking to, to work with partners and see how we can align around uh, other pieces of work happening in this space, like the Alberta Health Virtual Care Strategic Policy Framework and also the CPSA-led um, Alberta Virtual Care Healthcare Framework. Let's go to the next slide, please. When we talk about the virtual care strategy, this was um, created based on many of the principles of the patient medical home. And I won't read all the principles on the left-hand side of this uh, screen for you. 
but you'll be able to see quite easily that the, the principles within the proposed strategy align directly to some of the pillars of patient medical home implementation. One of the challenges in the space has obviously been the emergence of virtual only clinics like Babylon, Maple, Virtual Kids, um, and many others in this space. And I, I think what I can say about these services is they're not all equal, meaning the intent of the service, how it's rolled out, how these groups are attempting to partner in Alberta are all uh, quite a bit, quite different. And the only way you can really get at the intent is to work with the leadership teams of these virtual care clinic initiatives. And so uh, AMA and Physician Leads of Zach have been reaching out to and working, uh, listening to and promoting continuity of care, patients medical home, all the things that we would promote in a bricks and mortar setting to uh, some of the virtual care providers. And the responses are interesting because some are actually quite interested in how they can deploy uh, well in Alberta and enhance patients' medical home. And you know, others are less interested in changing how they intend to operate their service. And so this is work that's ongoing. And uh, it's not going to be possible to close the lid on virtual care moving into the future, but we're hopeful that we can mold both what the options are for um, Alberta physicians with bricks and mortar infrastructure to be sustainable delivering virtual care, but also mold how these partners uh, and services that are emerging in Alberta uh, might be better integrated in our setting. Let's go to the next slide, please. So there are four themes in the virtual care strategy. Um, the first two are, are compensation-based changes and won't go into detail around that, but you'll see specifically in um, strategy three and four, there is an intent in the long-term to enable better team-based care and care coordination uh, within the virtual care space as well as acknowledging some of the work around seamless transitions of care and how virtual care may enhance transitions. And again, these are two uh, significant elements of patients' medical home that we're looking to enable with a proper long-term virtual care strategy. So I, I just want to end by saying that, that we're, again, acutely aware this is a major issue. Um, AMA is working uh, and advocating for immediate changes to the virtual care schedule that would allow for sustainability of practice. And in fact, you know, I'll go as far as to say that um, without a meaningful partnership with Alberta Health around this issue, it would be very hard to move forward with other issues that exist right now um, in that partnership. And while uh, we're trying to do that as quickly as possible, we're also looking at the longer term view of virtual care to say, how do we best create the environment for virtual care to be um, effective in terms of medical home implementation into the future? So I'll, I'll leave it at that. And I think at this point, I'm passing it off to Ernst. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Brad. COVID-19. One word, one concept, so many different emotions and words that come to mind for, for us. Um, as Justin mentioned earlier, this was a placeholder in our last forum and little did we know how this would change our world. So some of the, world, the words that come to mind when I'm thinking of this in the last year, I'm thinking of loss, I'm thinking of grief, I'm thinking of isolation, frustration, burnout that all of us are feeling. Little did we know how much our world would have changed. And last year, we, our closing comment when it, as it pertains to COVID-19 was, whatever it takes, we will be leaning in. Little did we know how much that leaning in would mean and what an impact that would have in our lives as well as the lives of our patients. And it's because of 
because of our leaning in and the successes that we've seen that I'm going to just highlight briefly in my presentation here, that I'm actually filled with, with, with other words that's kind of coming to mind as well. So there's words like gratitude, there's words like collaboration and camaraderie, and there's words like hope that comes to mind. And I'm going to try to weave those words into some of the, um, the slides that I'm going to, to mention to you um, a little later on. Next slide. Thank you. So as it pertains to gratitude, um, I just want to, on behalf of PCN Physician Leads Exec, thank everyone present, as well as for those at home, for the tremendous effort, the sacrifice, the perseverance um, that we've witnessed in the last year. Our medical office assistants, our nurses, our PCN executive directors, our medical directors, every single physician in our PCNs, um, were able to ramp up, ramp down, continue with routine work, and then just COVID work throughout this last year. And it's really been um, a, a tremendous success. And um, I just want you to, to please convey this message on our behalf um, to every single person who has been involved in this. Um, I'm grateful um, for the collaboration that we've had with Alberta Health Services as it pertains to um, distribution of um, PPE at the onset of the pandemic, where it was very difficult to get um, PPE and how we were able to safely support our physicians in their community offices to, um, to support their patients with COVID-19. Um, in col collaboration with Alberta Health Services, we um, launched a single source of truth website for all information pertaining COVID-19. We work diligently um, with Alberta Health Services to incorporate the primary care physician in the scheduling and the booking system for COVID-19 testing so that we could receive the, vac um, the, the, the information when our patients tested positive for COVID-19. But we recognized that the, there were some gaps in that system and that not all patients provided their um, primary care provider um, when they booked their appointments. And for that, we developed processes to capture and create a safety net for patients so that if they tested positive, especially in the two major zones now, Edmonton and Calgary, there were, they were a safety net to capture each and every patient who tested positive and they were redirected either to their PCN access clinics or to their primary care provider. In addition to that, we were closely involved in regards to education for our physician members as well. We um, had multiple webinars. We worked in partnership with the AMA newsletters. And I'm going to go into that in a little more detail. So if I was the minister, or if I was a patient, or if I was you, I would ask what did PCNs do as it pertains to COVID-19? And my answer to you would be everything and more. There is really very little that we could have done more as it pertains to our efforts, our energy, our enthusiasm um, when, it, when it came to COVID-19. I'm going to try to weave um, some of the work that Justin, as well as um, Brad has highlighted um, earlier. I'm going to bring CII CPAR, virtual care and hospital to home to hospital into a true, true patient story for you. So this is a patient of mine, a 57 year old female. She has a history of Crohn's disease. She has a history of asthma and she visited emergency room. I would not have known about that encounter, was it not that I received an emergency room encounter because I'm signed up for CII and CPAR. The emergency room encounter stated the patient was seen for a pneumonia. In our current environment, that kind of struck me as odd and I went into Netcare, looked at the patient's result, saw that the patient had a CT scan as well as a chest x-ray showing that she has bilater bilateral consolidations. At the time of her visit, she did have a rapid COVID test, but that test was not available at the time that the patient left the hospital on two different kinds of antibiotics. So I saw that the patient actually did have a COVID diagnosis. Following our virtual care pathway that we've created, we, I was able to follow up on this patient. Because of her pneumonia, um, I recognized that, you know what, this is going to require me to contact my speciali specialty colleague um, through Specialist Link. We had a conversation, we had some parameters that were set in regards to monitoring this patient safely in the community. It just so happened that this patient did have a pulse oximeter at home, 
And I was able to very comfortably follow this patient through her journey virtually at home. Unfortunately, on day seven, the patient take, took a significant deterioration in her health. Her oxygen saturation dropped to 90. That was a trigger for me to send her back to hospital. The patient was seen in hospital, admitted to hospital, admitted to ICU, intubated and ventilated for two weeks. I received a discharge notification from this patient asking to follow up with this patient in a week. I followed up with the patient. She's having some post COVID related challenges, fatigue, shortness of breath. I was able to provide her with a, with, with a post COVID a rehabilitation guideline through the, um, through the um, strategic clin clinical networks um, information that they provided. And I felt like this patient was fully managed to the best of my ability through the mechanisms that we have in place to support patients like this. So what I'm trying to say is that everything that we are doing has a purpose and a reason and it is making a difference. And this is not the only example that I can provide in my own practice and I can see that there's probably multiple other examples like this um, to, to highlight and to showcase the, the work that we've done. At any and every table that we have, any opportunity that we have, we try to highlight the value of primary care that has led to the ability for us to manage up to 97% of all patients with COVID-19 diagnosis in the community, value, um, freeing up valuable resources in hospitals and definitely supporting the healthcare system um, in, in a way that I don't think anyone ha um, would have anticipated. Um, now, this slide also pertains to vaccination and our efforts in vaccination. And it is with our vaccination efforts, our role that we're playing in vaccination that I am filled with, with hope as well. And I'm going to go into this a little, little deeper with the next slides. Next slide, thanks. So this slide will just show and highlight um, the other word that came to mind when I said collaboration and com camaraderie. We've had a tremendous collaboration with all partners. Um, as Justin has mentioned previously as well, Alberta Health, Alberta Health Services, physicians, and all other stakeholders involved in patient care in the, um, in the last year. Through this, we were able to um, sit at different committees. We were able to have multiple webinars. We were part of major planning, planning groups, and we were involved in not only our local PCN, our zonal and our provincial work, but also at the national level, I've been able to showcase some of the successes that we've had. Next slide. Perfect, thanks. As it pertains to education, I think we all recognize that information overload has been one of the challenges that we had to deal with um, throughout this pandemic. For that reason, through um, collaboration with the AMA, as well as in, in our zones, we, we made things relevant for our family physicians and our PCN members through webinars, through newsletters, and whatever we could do to, to make the most current information as relevant as we could to our, to our physician members and our PCN staff. For that reason, as I've mentioned previously, a source of truth, a single source of truth through Alberta Health Services as it pertains to COVID-19 management. Um, we've um, created a national toolkit um, for um, vaccination as well through the COVID um, toolkit that you see there. A vaccine hesitancy being addressed through the Back the Vax um, um, website as well. So um, definitely trying to kind of lean in as it pertains to, um, to knowledge translation as well as getting relevant information into the hands of providers as much as we can. Next slide. And then I'm really excited to share with you the findings of the recent pilot for COVID-19 vaccination in community offices. In March, sorry, in, in, in April, um, on April 8th, we were um, approved to receive 200 doses of Moderna for 10 clinics as a pilot to see whether there is a feasible option for us as primary care providers to provide vaccines to our patients in a safe and a responsible and an accountable way to Alberta Health. Within a matter of three days, 
the majority of those vaccines were delivered to patients and recognizing that with a one, one week lead up, these patients fell into category 2B um, vaccination eligibility. So each of those patients that fell into that uh, um, category had to be um, identified through um, a list in our physician's offices, cold, cold call sent to the patient um, um, for, for the patient to book an appointment. And it was very labor intensive, on average about five to 10 calls to book one appointment. But the patients were so, so grateful in regards to what we've done. The fact that their family physician's office knows them enough to know that they are eligible for the vaccine through eligibility criteria, took the, um, took the, um, the, um, the, the effort to phone the patient, to book the patient in, and for them to receive the vaccine in the comfort, the familiar environment that they know as their medical home was tremendously um, helpful to the patient. A 4.9 out of five satisfaction rating that we received from all patients. We recognized that it was work um, and about one third of patients um, were actually booked in eventually because one third of patients um, already had an uh, appointment booked. One third of patients um, already had the vaccine and um, that other third is the patients that we had to work with. Interestingly enough, anecdotally from the booking staff, 10 to 15% of patients said that if it was not for the phone call that they've received from their family physician's office, they probably wouldn't have gone through the effort to book the appointment. So those are the people and the patients that we want to reach, the people that we can influence as it pertains to vaccine hesitancy and the, the conversations that we can have in order to get those patients vaccinated as well. So through this pilot that we had, we were able to present yesterday to Alberta Health a compelling um, um, message that we are without any doubt, absolutely confident that we are able to safely, accurately and accountably provide vaccination to our patients in the community. We are going to strongly advocate for a stable vaccine supply, and we are anticipating a further and a broader rollout of this in the next coming weeks. So stay tuned, we are, um, we are very excited about this. Now, as part of this pilot, we created a blueprint so that each and every clinic who wants to participate, if you have the blueprint in mind, uh, in hand, and go through the checklist, you are able to do this. You are able to do this safely, you're able to do it accountably, and you're able to do it effectively. 3,800 primary care providers is leaning in, in, any, in, in every way, managing patients with COVID-19 in the community, and now also helping patients to get vaccinated through either discussions, in regards to vaccine hesitancy, getting the patients the information that they need, or potentially even give, um, getting needles in their arms. Throughout our vaccination efforts, we see that there's major role, role players. There's Alberta Health Services, the major role player. There's pharmacy partners in the community, which works closely with us in regards to this. And then there's us as primary care providers. And so for those of you who are able to and willing to participate in giving the vaccine, please make sure that you follow the eligibility criteria in order to get signed up. But there's also an area of subpopulations where PCNs are perfectly positioned to help and to lean in when it, when it comes to vaccination. And those special populations are being identified in the zones. And there's already examples of that through, you know what, meat processing plants, um, inner city vulnerable populations, where we are actually able to partner with Alberta Health Services, Alberta Health, as well as our community partners in order to get those patients vaccinated. So with that being said, I'm going to close this discussion with um, the hope that in the next three to six months, through our vaccination efforts and the continued efforts that you provide in your clinics, um, we're going to see an end, end to this. And, um, and just again, thank you for, um, for all the, the hard work that we see. And I'm so proud to, to see how everyone is contributing to, to this pandemic. And, um, and, and, and it's really, it's wonderful to be part of this. And, um, and please continue to stay, stay motivated in the next few months. Thank you.
All right, I think it's to me now. Thanks, Ernst. Um, so we just wanted to bring you a brief update on uh, the early work of the Rural Sustainability Task Force. Uh, this uh, links quite heavily to continuity because obviously without a family physician or primary care provider, continuity just isn't possible. Uh, please advance the slide. So uh, the task force is a multi-stakeholder group uh, working to provide recommendations to and help inform the provincial PCN committee on topics relating to the sustainability of primary care delivery in rural Alberta. Uh, so we will be pleased to provide the Minister of Health uh, with recommendations on specific questions that were posed, which forms the backbone of the terms of reference for this group. Uh, the group includes representatives from the section of rural medicine, the academic sites, uh, U of A, U of C, uh, primary care network executive directors, PCN nurse practitioners, um, rural uh, uh, RHPAP, uh, as well as rural physicians, Alberta Health and the AMA. We're also hoping uh, through our research to be able to provide additional insights based on our findings that may actually uh, provide some groundwork or pathways uh, to what should be looked at next uh, in addition to what was already asked. Uh, the PPCNC will be providing advice on this uh, topic to the Minister of Health when all is said and done. Uh, currently, this is uh, chaired by uh, Shannon Berg from Alberta Health, as well as myself. Uh, the plan is to complete phased research activities, uh, which uh, we were struck in November 2020 uh, and have begun in the last couple months, these research activities. And we'll be doing this up until March 2022, so about one year from now. At that point, uh, culminating in a final policy recommendation to the PPCNC. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, th these four points are going to form or frame the research and recommendations that will be developed by the task force. And the hope is, again, that this will encompass what the minister has uh, specifically asked us to answer, as well as provide a comprehensive approach while also not trying to boil the ocean. And again, like I said before, th this is not intended to uh, solve what, let's be honest, is a wicked problem in, a, in rural medicine, um, because there are so many facets and so many uh, uh, connections and, and nuances to it, but it's to provide sort of a first step. And our hope is to provide sort of a clear way forward after this to say, what, what could the next steps be after we address this? So. Um, I am so pleased and want to give some shout out to the input of my colleagues uh, from the sections, uh, SFM, SRM, our municipal partners, uh, our nurse practitioner and PCN executive director in particular uh, for their representation and their input their input thus far. I uh, also want to point out to this group that everyone um, involved has really strong ties to either living and or working in rural Alberta's, uh, rural areas of Alberta and other provinces. So um, the, the perspectives here, I think, are very genuine and uh, hit home for everyone at this table. Uh, a special shout out as well to the academic physicians on our group that have really helped us um, to, to frame the wicked problem, as we're beginning to call it, uh, that we have in rural healthcare. Uh, just given how long they've been wrestling with these challenges from all different facets, we're very fortunate to have their wisdom guiding us uh, right out of the gate uh, as we've gotten started because, you know, again, boil the ocean issues, right? Uh, to, to date, the task force has developed a work plan and we're nearing completion of our initial literature review and jurisdictional scan. With that, I will pass this on to Justin, I believe. Yeah, thanks, Jordan. Getting into the last but uh, not least um, element of all the things we're, we're working through the past year here is the ministerial order. Um, and as most of you know, this is this is sort of the the, the structure. This is this is how we come together. This is uh, you know this is our organization, if for lack of a better term. Um, feel free to get into the next slide and I'll just go from there. Crystal, thanks. So, so yeah, for I think everybody in this room, you understand that our provincial primary care network committee and zonal committees are, are built by virtue of a ministerial order. Um, prior to the first MO, as uh, you know, the easy way to say it, 
we, we had our structures, but they really weren't formalized. And it was really important for a number of reasons at the, at the outset of, of setting up a ministerial order because it created some, for lack of a better term, legitimacy, um, some certainty in uh, our organizations. If you all recall, there was a time when we questioned whether PCNs were going to be a thing of the future, if they were going to change in some material way or not be around at all. We all saw value in it, um, and, and we, you know, endeavored to, to create this structure to, again, create that, uh, that legitimacy and that, uh, that permanence, if you will. Um, and I think what, what I'm getting at here and what's so, what's so cool about this is it sort of reinforces the importance of PCNs and all of the hard work that everyone's done because it has highlighted change in a major way. Um, you know, we just renewed a second ministerial order for a full five-year term. The first one was a three-year uh, three term. Um, and, you know, this, this was in the time of a very new government with a very different, uh, you know, priorities and outlook on, on um, how things should work. And I think a lot of you know the, the challenges that uh, uh, have kind of come along with that. So you can imagine that there would be worries about something like this. And I, I don't... I can honestly say there was not a moment where any of us at the Leeds exec table were faced with, oh boy, is this going to be something that just goes away? If anything, it was, how are we going to make this work with our Alberta health colleagues and AHS? So really reflecting that, uh, that recognition of just how important uh, PCNs are and the value it provides to Albertans and patients. Um, within that, within the ministerial order, there's a two-year priority list. Um, and again, you know, everything is a shared opportunities. And while we might uh, sort of rank those a little bit differently in our day to day, at the end of the day, we're all we've all been contributing to a lot of these pieces anyways. It is included in your package to review as you can read there. Um, and again, you can see that, that everything we've highlighted so far today is found in this two year list. And if there are further questions, uh, feel free to reach out to any one of us and we'll, we'll try to address those. So you can move to the next slide. And I get the uh, the honor of you know thanking everyone and, and closing this part of the uh, discussion before we move into our breakouts and etc. And it's funny I was just looking down at my phone a few times and I you know I want to apologize to people that I'm certainly not uh, texting or looking at fun memes. That's for other times, um, but it's actually a metaphor for what I think every one of us is dealing with right now. And uh, for myself, I'm actually on hospitalist service right now, so thank the Lord for good residents. Um, and I'm just getting the odd question here and there, but, but what I'm getting at is, uh, you know, just seeing all the things we've all done over this past year, um, we're all juggling several balls at once um, at, at all times, you know, be it as parents, as friends, as professionals, um, you, you know, dealing with a, a level of, of expectation and professionalism that uh, I, 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 it's awe-inspiring to watch people do and, and still manage and still deliver the care and the, um, you know, the, the excellence that we have is, is pretty cool. I think for all of you, you know, for myself, even he, seeing this, this presentation and realizing all of those things you just saw are things that have been going on this year, um, you know, this, it, it wasn't just COVID. Every single one of those pieces has been moving full steam ahead. And that's because of the efforts of everyone in this room. So, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, can't say that enough. And I'm stalling because this is my farewell, my last uh, PCN forum to be, you know, part of the leads group. I'm usually so cool, <laughs> but uh, the emotion is just because it's been such an honor to work with all of you. It's, uh, it's just, you know, been such an experience. Um, I'm going back almost seven and a half years now to a very different world, very different relationships. Um, and, you know, I was thinking about words and it's probably growth is my favorite word. And when I say that, I mean, you know, growth for myself professionally, growth of organizations, um, you know, PCN leads exec, PCNs, the professionals that are within those, the professional growth that I've seen all of my colleagues um, kind of go through, um, the growth of our relationships, uh, you know, between Alberta Health Services and Alberta Health, it's just been nothing but an upward, an, an upward trajectory. Um, and I've been so fortunate to be part of that. I don't intend to, you know, disappear, but, uh, but it's just something that's uh, near and dear to my heart. And I want to thank all of you. And with that, I uh, will introduce us into the next piece. I think I will say that I've never been this on time in my life. It is 9 a.m. 
So, you know, at least after, you know, seven and a bit years, um, I, I finally, uh, you know, sorted that. But with that, we're going to take a little bit of a bio break, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Um, please download Mentimeter because we're going to use that for our small groups. And um, we'll talk to you all shortly. Thanks again. Okay, so it is uh, my job here to walk us through just a quick debrief uh, with a little bit of crowdsourcing of what wisdom you guys were able to uh, collaborate with or, or, or show for yourselves in the collaboration now breakout groups. So we'll, we have uh, hopefully got one volunteer from each group to tell us one thing uh, from, uh, from your collaboration time. I have a list here. I'd like to start with uh, Michelle Henney's room, please. We have, Jamie is going to be our spokesperson. You're putting me first. Um, is, it, is it possible to put the questions back on the board again, just as the reminder? Do we have that uh, ability? Support I don't support? think we'll be able to do it very quickly, but- um, okay, Can you just say the question maybe again? The first one? Sorry, it's I didn't- even, It's even just, it's just one, one highlight from the whole discussion. It's in the chat, Jamie. Given the past year, how have you changed or adjusted PCN operations to stay successful? Oh, perfect. perfect. There you go. Yeah, thank you, Christy. <laughs> Um, so we had some really good conversations um, and basically how we had to adjust, it was mainly um, the conversation was around working from home, how we're supporting staff a little bit differently, what our um, work-life balance um, looked like and how that was a little bit different. Um, some conversation around how even though we had a little bit more flexibility, like maybe there was the work from home, it also and there's a lot of positives to that. Like, you know, maybe you could throw a load of laundry in in the middle of the day and things like that. And it helped you a bit with work-life balance, but it was really challenging um, that when it came to defining the set amount of time that you really should be um, working versus having your work or, or your life balance, I guess, with work. Um, because a lot of people, there was late meetings. Um, so maybe their day started at eight, eight in the morning, but they were having meetings till nine and it was just so easy to get on to a Zoom call. Um, so that was one of the, the big things that came up and just how you know we needed to kind of make sure that we were managing that okay and giving ourselves some um, cutoff times. Um, that was from the first conversation. Did you want me to speak to the second conversation as well, Jordan? Uh, no, just one one uh, point from the whole thing. Yep. Okay, perfect. Thanks very much, Jamie. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can relate to that. Uh, next in line would be Michelle Tobias Paul's room. Hey, from my room, uh, Mona Delisle's going to uh, bring a couple thoughts forward. Thanks, Michelle. So similar to you, Jamie, there was, was like a lot of talk about the resilience and the way that the PCNs were creative in coming together to create ways to connect and um, stay positive throughout all of this work. So that was a, a high point, I think, in the pandemic, but also we had a really good discussion about virtual care and some of the impacts that's having and um, some ideas around where that, how that's gonna impact us in the next two years. So really good conversation in the group. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Um, in Michelle's group, sorry, uh, Mark, your turn. Jesse from my group will uh, will share a highlight. Oh, hi, I hope you can hear me. Hi, everyone. It's Jesse. Um, our group had really great discussion. We also talked a lot about virtual care, but maybe I'll pick a different one so that. Um, we can get some other things that we talked about. So one thing that was interesting for takeaways is when we were talking about um, communication and changes, it was interesting to hear some perspective around um, changing the way that AHS and PCNs are working together. And so it was really helpful to kind of hear um, 
how they've connected differently through this and uh, continue to work together, which has improved the working relationships during COVID, but then also it'll continue to evolve those partnerships. So I found that discussion really interesting as um, it's really focused on critical changes of how we can work together, find new ways to ensure that that information is targeting the right people, um, you know, sharing stories of how we're connecting people to the processes that are changing, and that's assisting with um, the buy-in and then the work that we're doing. And so it was really interesting to see that um, although we all think we have really good communication, um, it really shifted our mentality about how we continue to evolve those working relationships. So I felt like that was actually a fairly big takeaway um, from our discussion. Thank you, Jesse. Appreciate it. Um, moving on to Lori's room. Hello, oh, yes, I'll, I'll be speaking. My name is Rakesh Patel. So we had a great discussion um, about various different areas, but the one I'll pick is really about zonal, st zonal structure and support. So within, um, within the Calgary zone, there's a business unit, which has really helped help coordinate um, progression with COVID management and really CI, CPAR and progression of that. And that was viewed as a strength. However, on the, on the flip side of that is smaller PCNs and maybe say two PCNs are forming their own zone struggle to achieve that same level of support. And just a suggestion maybe that there are other smaller PCNs across the whole province that are struggling in a similar way. And actually maybe if they can band together out with their zonal boundaries, it may provide them that leverage and size and funding efficiency to achieve more effect. Interesting concept and near and dear to my heart. Thank you, uh, Rigesh. Uh, moving on to Ashton's room. Heather will share the highlight. So our highlight was really about pivoting and change. That that this year was all about, you know, adapting, and 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 balancing the the old work that we were previously doing and all of the new COVID work and the the new environment with which we had to function. In. The bright lights um, that were highlighted was um, the leadership um, that was present um, within PCNs, the collaborative spirit, um, the, the coming together. Thank you very much, Heather. Uh, Bill's room, please. Nicola. Hi, thanks. I'm Nicola Chapel from Calgary West Central. And our question I'm going to talk about is the building on Jesse's. The, um, ideas regarding communications and maintaining PCN partnerships um, during these times. And uh, just to inject a little bit of humor for those who know me, you probably wouldn't expect me to say um, one of the things that was critical was data uh, that has helped facilitate the communication and partnerships. And uh, where this really trans uh, hired for me was during the infographics, similar to what Ernst presented this morning um, with regards to the pilot projects with COVID-19 vaccinations in family docs offices. The two specific ones were how family physicians were able to support AHS um, during the pandemic's waves to keep patients out of hospital and um, provide that safety net for both attached and unattached patients. Um, those infographics really were powerful in terms of sharing with AH and with our AHS partners. For people at AHS that we all, we already had great communications, it you know just further solidified that. But for some of those specialists and partners that perhaps were didn't didn't really understand how primary care and family medicine could make a difference to AHS, um, this was a very simple way to share that message. And so I think it's opened doors significantly for us. And the second um, infographic was even more powerful. So yeah, data. Very much, Nicola. Uh, I think we're on to Sean's group now. Uh, Leslie is going to report for us, please. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, we had a great discussion in our group, and I would say that the the uh, that theme would be forced innovation that was put upon us, and which actually in in our discussion turned out to be some positive outcomes. You know, there was the adaptability, but you know, with the patient education over the new platforms, but also it, it enabled um, 
for myself, practice facilitator, to reach out to the multi multidisciplinary teams and help physicians utilize their team to uh, for patient care and reach out to those very um, uh, you know complex patient populations, especially during this time, and you know to to reach out to them either by phone or virtual and to let them know that they are be still being looked after but to use your team. So it wasn't, we didn't want the physicians to feel like they were alone. Use your team. Okay, thank you very much, Leslie. Um, Sue, your group, please. Yes, and Dr. Uh, Chodi is gonna speak for our group. Yep, and, uh, so I'm Giratra, yes. So from our group, uh, we discussed a little bit uh, overlapping with other groups, but uh, the main thing that I wanted to point out is about the funding which is currently being used. So in the group we discussed that there is a huge difference in the funding method, or at least how it works currently for urban versus rural. And that because it affects it differently because for rural communities, the numbers keep changing based on physicians living, based on the population served, because sometimes you also draw in nearby areas, not just your local community the numbers fluctuate greatly and that affects funding. So that was a kind of a highlight. And also we just put up the role of assistance because so far we know they've been regulated by CPSC that we're not sure where they We know that maybe sometimes in the hospitals will be like in ORs or other places where they'll be helping out. And so they do have a role to play, but we were not sure if uh, like PCMs would be able to have like a P, like a physician assistant, which would be separately funded, not coming from the PCM funding, if uh, like uh, the health would be able to assist with that, because that would actually provide like uh, a like like a different level of care and the PCM as well, because right now we have registered nurses who do that kind of but having a physician assistant, then we could also screen more like you no know, kind of uh, things which need to be there to in a more timely manner and they and we can reach out to the physicians uh, responsible, so that would help as well. Uh, the funding was the biggest issue we discussed because uh, there is a huge discrepancy between urban funding and uh, rural funding. And uh, so it's kind of, yeah, we feel the focus method is not actually relevant in a rural. I think it's a more public interest. So that's another take point uh, from our group. Okay, thank you, Karaj. Uh, moving on to Carrie's group. Yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Trevor Day volunteered to do that and we said we'd buy him a virtual coffee. Um, yeah, so in our group, we worked through the first two questions and, and probably one of the biggest takeaways was with respect to that second question. So there's a lot of cracks within the system that patients can fall through. And I think to some degree, COVID-19 in the silo of care has uh, exacerbated a lot of those cracks. And so we discussed how there's a lot of high value technical solutions to help manage the transitions and to help manage the complexity that we as primary care providers can use. So for example, having high quality patient panels being proactive and outreaching out to those complex patients, and then also using tools like CAI and CPAR to, to help with those transitions and help manage that complexity. Okay, thanks very much, Trevor. And final group, Bonnie's group. Yeah, off to you, Lorna. Thank you. Okay, thanks for giving me that last thought. Uh, what really struck up for us, I would sort of sum up, sum up on the communication question was around resilience. And at the very time we could disconnect, we became very connected with each other at um, the local levels, at the zone levels that we had um, our, our zone uh, was, is very spread out for, I would I'm speak for central zone now, is very spread out and we uh, really came together to um, help, help each other to work through the pandemic. And uh, I had one example that we had in Red Deer that I'd like to give to how we learned, uh, how we established new relationships, not just maintaining relationships through the all email outbreak, how the uh, city and various social groups and all email and Red Deer and the PCN came together to establish relationships that I think will carry on beyond the pandemic and looking at how we can improve primary care in our community going forward. Thank you very much, Lorna. So uh, I think that concludes our uh, breakout sort of uh, sharing time.
caring and sharing. Um, I certainly think that a lot of those themes were probably discussed in most of the groups. Uh, I see them very well connected to each other. So thanks for providing your feedback uh, on that. Okay, so uh, basically uh, we're here to close this off at this point. Uh, just wanted to say thank you for to everybody for taking time out of your busy schedules to come together today in a sort of a new and unique way um, for how we're doing this forum this year. Uh, thank you for your participation in the questions and providing that into the chats for us. Uh, thank you for uh, engaging in the breakout sessions. Uh, thank you for all your contributions of the work uh, done since we last saw each other in person, which is no doubt above and beyond anything that we had done in the previous years. Uh, it's been very difficult environment and we had no shortage of success to celebrate today um, as spring and maybe more winter and then fall and then summer and then fall again uh, do come through. I, I do hope you all get the opportunity to take some time to relax and recharge. Uh, we all need to take care of ourselves and we need to take care of each other if we have to continue this good work. Um, something that uh, has hit home to me was uh, a nurse that I'd worked with was just very passionate about saying, oh, you know, we need to give each other a lot of grace in these times. I'm really trying to be intentional to do that. And I'm like, oh gosh, like well, what an amazing insight. And uh, because I, I see a lot of, a lot of strain. Uh, I see people who work together normally as teams uh, being, you know, you can see that people are being snippy with each other sometimes, kind of like it is in a family, if that's all who you're seeing these times, uh, if that you're stuck seeing with all the time. And, and it just really reminded me that we're all in a similar spot. And uh, I just kind of using that for myself to, and, and it's helped a lot. So uh, I hope you're able to do the same. Uh, please take the time to complete the brief evaluation. Uh, you can use the QR code with your phone uh, to, to bring that up with using the camera function. Uh, it was designed to take about one minute, so please do it. <laughs> I would super appreciate if you do. Um, we do use your feedback to continually improve. Uh, please enjoy the rest of your day and the weekend ahead. Uh, look forward to meeting with my physician colleagues for the in-camera session in a half hour. Uh, I want to do, again, as Brad mentioned there, a special thanks to the ACT team for helping organize, facilitate, and make this all run smoothly. Uh, switching, switching pace to do this in a virtual was, was interesting, and I know that they were above and beyond on that as well. So thank you to all of you as well.